Hello, my dear brothers and sisters, and welcome to another edition of Zimuzo, where we have kingdom conversations on the pathways of life. Today, I'll be speaking from the subject, make room for those who are of a weaker faith. And I'm taking my bearings off of Romans chapter 14, the entire chapter 14, and the first nine verses of Romans 15 in the New Living Translation. Verses 1 to 3 read, Accept other believers who are weak in faith, and don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. For instance, one person believes it's all right to eat anything, but another believer with a sensitive conscience will only eat vegetables. Those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't, and those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do, for God has accepted them. My brothers and sisters, we are not all at the same level of faith, so we must make room for those who are of a weaker faith, and we must not spend our time, as the Bible says, arguing with them over who is right and who is wrong. I want you to remember that it's the Holy Spirit that convicts, and not us in ourselves. So we want to be very careful not to become judgmental in the process of trying to correct those who are not at the same level of faith as we are. Remember this, verse 3b of Romans 14 says, for God has accepted of them. Let us remember that we are all accepted into God's beloved once we give our lives to Christ and then we begin what is the totality of our life's journey on that walking out our salvation in fear and trembling pathway that is referenced in Philippians 2 from verse 12. Apostle Paul actually called this running the race. We are accepted already once we give our lives to Christ. So even as we are steadily growing in faith, part of the journey is going to be stumbling, falling, failing, and be being pulled back up time and again. Remember the same Bible tells us that the righteous man may fall seven times. Even through all that, remember that we are in Christ. This means we are already accepted in the beloved. This means that even those who are of a weaker faith are already accepted. It is not that there is a certain level of spiritual maturity we are going to get to and then God will accept us. No. Once you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, according to Romans 10 verses 9 to 10, you are saved and you are accepted. But God being God, he will keep calling you and I higher because he has work for us to do. He has new levels of glory he wants to deliver through us. He has lives he wants to change and touch and transform through us. Therefore, we cannot afford to stagnate spiritually, but we have to keep pressing in to grow to the next level. But this is also where we want to be very careful, so that we do not become spiritually pardon me, so that we do not become spiritually arrogant. We want to remember that we ourselves were once at that starting point, and that it has nothing to do with our age or our wisdom. If you remember the conversation between Elihu and Job, in Job chapter 32 from verses 7 to 9, we will all come to God at different ages and stages in life. And the totality of our past lives and our experiences actually tend to shape how our journeys in Christ progress. We all learn to drive, for those of us who do, at different ages. So every time you're on the road and you're busy honking at a learner, you need to remember that you were once there. And while we're on the subject, you are still not the best driver on the road even today. Likewise, as mature as you may be spiritually, you are still not the most mature Christian. So please, let us be patient as the word of God enjoins us with those who are still on the earlier phases of their journey. Remember, in verse 4 of this same scripture, there is an injunction to us. It says, who are you to condemn someone else's servants? Their own master will judge whether they stand or fall. And with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his approval. Amen? Who are we to condemn someone else's servant? Let's remember that it is God who is the master of those weak people who will also judge them, whether they will stand or fall. It is actually better for us to face our own individual journeys and be sure that when our master judges us, we will indeed stand. That's 4b, the later part of that verse 4. It says, and with the Lord's help, they will stand and receive his approval. This is the thing for you and I to remember, that while we may stay in the place of judging, our God is actually staying in the place of loving. Our God is committed to that his, I know the plans I have for you word over every single one of us. And that includes those who are weaker in faith than we are. Think about it. For those who are parents, 
that even though we may have a child who is not living up to what we think is their potential and capacity, we still love them and we still have great plans for their lives. This is why the Bible says in Matthew 7 and verse 11, that if we, being evil, know how to give good gifts to our children, then how much more our Father, who is himself, goodness. When we read from verses 5 to verse 9 of this Romans chapter 14, the truth that we see in this is that whatever we are doing, we are actually doing our best to know and to honor God as best we can. And it is important for us to recognize that even those who are of a lesser faith are actually doing their best also to honor Him. That we've moved progressively has more to do with what the Spirit is teaching and convicting us of rather than our own personal efforts. We live and die to honor God if we are truly His. And it makes sense because in verse 9 it tells us clearly that Jesus Christ also died and rose for this very purpose, to be the Lord of both the living and the dead. So I promise you that he is also the Lord of the living who have a lesser faith than you and I are. Verse 10 is very clear. It asks the question, so why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God for the scripture says, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bend before me and every tongue will declare allegiance to God. Verse 12, yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. So let's stop condemning each other. Let us decide instead to live in such a way that we will not cause another believer to stumble and fall. Yes, my brother and sister, let me assure you that part of giving this personal account to God is that we are going to account for how we exemplified love. We are going to account for whether we walked in judgment, in criticism, or in condemnation of others, particularly those who have a lesser faith, a weaker faith than us, whereas God was calling us to be love, to be light, and to be life in the lives and the hearts of others. Verse 13 says, let us stop condemning each other. You and I must decide instead to live in such a way that we will not cause another believer to stumble and fall because they are on a different phase of the journey. If somebody, verse 14 says, believes that something is wrong to eat, then that person, for them, it is wrong. And so the Bible enjoins us, particularly in verse 15, that we should not cause distress to another believer because of what we eat. Because if we do that, we are not acting in love. We should not cause distress to another believer because what it means is that we are not helping to build them up and to edify them. Indeed, that verse 15, the latter part, goes further to say, don't let your eating ruin someone for whom Christ died. Oh my God, I want you to think about this again, that what we do should not cause distress for someone else, but more importantly, that we should not let our eating ruin someone for whom Christ died. My brother, my sister, you know that this is really not just a conversation about food. It's a conversation about our lifestyle choices, about our decisions, and the things that we do on this journey and pathway. There are some extreme things, but there are also some very small things. And what the Spirit of God is asking us to do today is to check our conduct daily, to see in what ways we might be pushing our own views on others who are less mature spiritually and otherwise. When we come down to verse 17 of this scripture, it tells us that the kingdom of God is not a matter of what we eat or drink but of living a life of goodness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Verse 18, 18 says, If you serve Christ with this attitude, you will please God and others will approve of you too. Verse 19, So then, let us aim for harmony in the church and to try to build each other up. I want to draw your attention back to the fact that living a life of goodness and peace and joy is in the Holy Spirit. I want to emphasize that this is a conversation about the Holy Spirit. We mature as we get increasingly knowledgeable about, intimate with, and submissive to the Holy Spirit, who then begins to guide us into all truth, who then refines us on the journey. You and I did not become as spiritually mature as we are today by ourselves. It was by the help of the Holy Spirit of God. So please, my brother, my sister, whatever else you do, do not be arrogant, and please make room for those who are still on their way up. Verse 20 of Romans 14 tells us, do not tear apart the work of God over what you eat. And I remind you that this is not strictly about food. Be mindful, be mindful of the fact that our assignment is the unification of the body. 
is this about drawing men to Christ. It is about shining our light so that men may glorify God. We should not tear apart. That is not what God has asked us to do. In your journey of maturing and pulling others along with you, yes, there is always a place for reproof, for instruction, for correction in love, for training in righteousness. This is why scripture exists. And we see this in 2 Timothy 3 from verses 16 to 17. But I beg you to please allow the Holy Spirit of God lead you always in your interactions. Know when to be still, know when to be quiet, and to rather go into prayer on a matter where you believe that someone needs to change their ways or to come up higher. Don't always insist and force and cause people to stumble, because stumbling, it, it may not even be about them doing the wrong thing necessarily. It could just be that in your interactions with them, in my interactions with them, we can be so arrogant, so critical, so judgmental, and so unloving that they can't really begin to see what is truly different between us and the unbelievers out there. And the tendency is that people begin to gravitate away from the church rather than towards it. May that not be the kind of light that we shine in Jesus' mighty name. Let me reiterate that there is a place for keeping some things in the place of your prayer with God. Between um, verses 20 and 22, you will see an injunction there where it says that you may believe there is nothing wrong with what you are doing, but keep it between yourself and God. If you have made some efforts to share a viewpoint, a perspective, an insight, a revelation with someone who is of a lesser faith and they are not currently accepting, don't overdo it. Take it to the place of prayer and ask for the Lord to, to illuminate the word, the message, the revelation in the lives of the other person. Stay in prayer. That is an act of love. I'm really minded to draw your attention, my brother and sister, back to verse 19 of Romans chapter 14. It says, so then let us aim for harmony in the church and to try to build each other up. I want you to understand that this is the assignment that we carry. We are supposed to draw men onto us and not to repel them from us by our judgmental natures and our criticisms. I will run quickly through some verses in Romans chapter 15. From verse 1 it says, We who are strong must be considerate of those who are sensitive about things like this. We must not just please ourselves. We should help others do what is right and build them up in the Lord. For even Christ didn't live to please himself. And I take it further to verse 5 where there is a prayer. It says, May God who gives this patience and encouragement help you to live in complete harmony with each other. Can you hear it again? As is fitting for followers of Jesus Christ. Verse 6. Then all of you, both those of you who are stronger in faith and those who are weaker, can join with one voice, giving praise and glory to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. My brothers and sisters, listen to verse 7 to 9. Therefore, accept each other just as Christ has accepted you, so that God will be given glory. Remember that Christ came as a servant to the Jews to show that God is true to the promises he made to their ancestors. He also came that the Gentiles might give glory to God for his mercies to them. If God is a God that is loving of Jews and Gentiles, then I promise you that he is a God who is loving of those who are strong in faith as well as those who are weaker in faith and who are still in the journey of growth. He is still merciful towards them. And that same grace, love and mercy is what he expects us to manifest in representation of our God and Father that we proclaim to serve. I hope that this is clear and I pray the Holy Spirit will help you to see it with added clarity in the name of Jesus Christ. Spirit of the living God, I want to say thank you, Lord, even for this short exhortation. Thank you for showing us that, Lord, spiritual maturity is a journey and is a journey that we must undertake with understanding and be guided by the Holy Spirit in love. Father, help us that we do not become spiritually arrogant because we are feeling better than some people who are still up in the faith. Help us to be reminded about the fact that it's not about who is older or who has been in church longer or who gave their life to Christ first. But that Lord God, King of glory, as long as everyone is on a journey in you, you are the one that helps. And our role, O God, is to manifest your light and your love in the lives of those ones so that we will not push them away from you, but we will draw them closer to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Help us, O God. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. If you have been listening to this message and you don't yet have a deep and personal relationship with God, you've heard about it, you've repelled it, you've been dancing around it, I want to encourage you that these are not the times to be outside of the brethren. 
outside of the, 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 the beloved of God, the family of our Father. I want to welcome you and ask you to come today into God's fold and give your life fully to Him. And if you're ready to make this decision, it's very simple. I ask you to pray after me and say, Lord Jesus, Father, thank you. Thank you for the journey I've been on. But today, Lord, I come to you. I bring everything that I am and I lay them at your feet and I say, Father, wash me clean. Wash me of every sin. Wash me of every error, every mistake of the past. Father, cast my sins into the sea of forgetfulness. Wash me with the blood of Jesus Christ. I believe, Lord Jesus, that you are the Son of God. I believe that you came to this earth, that you went to the cross, you died, you shed your blood for me. I believe that you rose on the third day and that you are currently seated at the right hand of God the Father, making intercession for those who are your own. Father, write my name in the book of life, O God. I place my hands in your hands and ask, O God, that for the rest of my days, you help me to journey in you, in faith, in spiritual maturity, and to do the assignments for your kingdom and glory that you would have me do on this side of eternity. In Jesus' mighty name. If you have prayed that prayer, I welcome you into the family of God. I promise you that this is the best place to be. Open your heart to God and allow His Spirit to illuminate your understanding and your pathway, even as you grow from level to level in spiritual maturity. In Jesus' mighty name. God bless you for praying. God bless you in Jesus' name. Please don't do this alone. Find a Bible-believing church and a community of faith that can help you to grow on this journey. Bless you, my brother and sister, in Jesus' name. I want to thank you all for listening. And I look forward to our next conversation on Zimozo as we discuss issues as shown by the Holy Spirit on the pathways of life. God bless you.